Hello everyone, welcome to another Identity in 15 video. Today we're going to be talking about multi-factor auth um, and when it can hurt to implement it. Um, it's a little bit uh, not talked about as much, but there is a cost to implementing any factor of authentication. And so we want to talk through a little bit about, you know, where that exists and, and maybe where it can be avoided. Um, we'll be streaming this uh, or, or premiering this live on uh, on YouTube, and so we'll be in the comments, and so please ask any questions if you have during the presentation. Um, we'll be happy to answer, and then also afterwards, leave a comment, and, and we'll see that, and we'll, we'll be able to respond and answer whatever questions you might have. So feel free to chat along. Uh, let's get right into it, though. The first thing I want to talk through is um, when you add the uh, uh, another factor of authentication, a lot of times it's a physical uh, factor of authentication. And so those physical devices, whether it is a um, like some sort of key cryptography um, or your phone device, that just adds that layer of um, complexity to the system. And um, that's called um, an ownership factor of auth. And primarily, right, now there is a, a need for managing all of that. So if, if you're an employer and you're wanting your employees to um, be more secure logging into your system. You now have to have that whole uh, suite of providing keys, um, providing the support to uh, help implement that with each of your employees. Because uh, I, mean, you're going to have a bunch of different uh, departments that differ in tech savviness, and so there's a larger cost um, just in the maintenance um, and and upkeep of that system for that added security. Additionally, ownership inherently means that ownership can then be taken or, or lost in some way, right? And so um, where other factors may not have similar issues, um, a physical piece of, of, of a physical key can uh, be taken without someone's un, uh, knowing that it was taken or, or used if it was placed misplaced somewhere. So kind of in simple terms, um, the physical device brings in the the limitations of having something physical in a digital world. Uh, next, I want to talk back on the initial factor when we talk about multi-factor authentication, and that the password itself is kind of that first factor. Um, and, and inherently, a password is kind of straightforward, and a lot of people have them and use them, and, and we know about them, but it's in the management of these passwords that can um, kind of create a second factor that a user has to manage um, in order to utilize that password correctly. So the policies around passwords are put in place because, as you can see, computers are good at guessing things. And so the password strength is heavily um, uh, reliant on what a computer can do just to brute force it. Obviously, administrators can put in um, uh, policies around preventing brute force attacks, um, but we're always on a ticking time clock where the better computers get, the easier it's gonna be for them to attack. The, the dilemma is, is that there is a, a, a limitation in that if the policy is presented to be very, very strict, then a user then ha is not a computer, and they now have to come up with um, a, a password that meets that policy. Uh, where that has uh, kind of come back to hurt uh, the overall security is that when a pattern is presented, uh, you know, say some 12 character password so that, you know, it takes millennia to crack um, and maybe it needs special characters. And, and then someone says, oh, well, well, let's throw in some, some history protection, right? So users can't use the same password over again or similar passwords. Um, and then someone might think, oh, well, uh, they should be changing it every month or every three months, uh, multiple times a year or something like that. Even every year sometimes, that kind of puts some onus back onto the user to kind of keep track of all that. And again, we're not computers. And so if the user isn't adept at using other tools to manage their passwords, now they are required to memorize this ever-changing, very complex um, password structure. And what has ended up happening is you end up decreasing security because as humans, we want to then 
make something simple. And so from an attack vector standpoint, if you have very, very strict, you know, frequently changing passwords, the likelihood that your users are, are, are utilizing easy to guess passwords or common passwords goes up immeasurably. Um, in which case now you don't have the problem of needing a computer to guess something in centuries. Um, someone can have a, a, a predefined set, um, or, or worst case scenarios, users, you know, write things down and then you have that physical, um, problem again, where, you know, a piece of paper with the password on it now becomes your attack vector. There has been many of exploits, um, all traced back to a sticky note on a monitor somewhere because, you know, we can't <laughs> be responsible for remembering certain things. And so when a user is presented with a challenge, they're going to find the easiest way around it. So both of those two things, um, and, and multi-factor in general, all affect, um, the, the other areas of identity management, right? So recovery specifically, um, and, and just getting into your account, each additional factor requires some sort of knowledge, um, and it's tricky because if you're not tech savvy, something simple to a developer or a systems admin, and they think, oh, this would be easy for someone to, of course, a simple little extra security, and then we get so much more uh, protection. That might not be that simple, and that might not be that easy for every user. And so in situations where uh, a password was entered incorrectly too many times, and then maybe they're locked out or, um, or a password was forgotten, and that second factor needs to be used that puts that again back on the user to uh, provide that in a situation where maybe a second factor is used uh, maliciously well now that second factor is is can be um, trusted to change a password or change username or change profile information um, and so again it goes back onto the user if they're not savvy enough to understand, hey, I lost my key for a little bit. Maybe I should check and make sure nothing was changed, nothing was, was um, uh, altered. Little things can happen. Even if someone gets into your system, changes something small and gets back out and unbundles to the user, uh, trusting that second factor auth as if it is that person can be a, a vector in which someone gets elevated access because the belief that the user, because of those extra factors, is who they say they are, may um, result in lowering guards in other areas. When you have a physical key to a physical building, someone coming in uh, to that building may be spotted by some by a, a different person and say, "Hey, you're not supposed to be here." And that's that like added layer of protection. But in the digital world, if we think that having multi factors of auth to get into somewhere, we don't need that. You know, say. In, in a banking transaction, um, uh, alerting users every time something sensitive happens, uh, if they come in from multi-factor auth or they have multi-factor auth enabled, maybe you turn that off. Well, you know, that can then lead to um, situations that you wouldn't have found yourself in otherwise. So the big elephant in the room with whenever you're talking about multi-factor auth is SMS one-time password. It was kind of... Uh, one of the first um, second factors of authentication because everyone has a telephone. And um, when you're talking about uh, using a telephone, even if they don't have a physical phone, if they have a company phone that can receive text or um, automated uh, robots can call and talk th a, a person through um, entering a, a special code, all that is all well and good. The big problem is Adding that third party means you're now increasing your attack vectors with whatever attack vectors that third party has. In this case, it's telephone companies. Um, so telecommunication companies are legacy tech, right? It's just towers and wires. And so there are attack vectors that exist in telecommunications that don't exist, you know, browsing the web or, or using um, encrypted traffic between two, two devices. So when you're not favoring uh, encrypted communication or cryptographic keys, you're relying on some other piece, of, uh, some other technology that has it, that can be um, attacked itself to provide that code. Well, now 
a user or, or, or uh, a bad actor can attack the vulnerable piece um, and utilize information from other data breaches to find new victims. So in one situation, say um, uh, bad actors have access to databases of information, addresses, phone numbers, um, username and passwords, but if they have SMS one-time passwords, or if they want any one-time passwords, right, that kind of stops them in their tracks. E they can't log in because maybe they need to be in the same country as, as the user or um, they have to have a second factor. Um, but if only SMS one-time password is set up and your account says, okay, cool, this person has a username and password, they have a whole um, extra code to be applied. Well, if a bad actor is able to hijack the um, the SIM card, well, now they can gain full access. And as far as the system's concerned, this is a you know completely trusted person. So in a real situation, I had a colleague who uh, had his SIM card swapped. Uh, so somewhere in 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 the world of breaches, uh, the attacker was able to gain enough access to the telecommunications company either through um, an exploit or through a bad actor inside the company to uh, convince them to SIM swap for a phone number that they knew was listed on a cryptographic um, currency exchange. So all they had was, you know, phone number uh, and password to a cryptographic uh, exchange, but because they had that phone number, they could get the SIM swap. My colleague was sitting and doing something on his computer. Luckily, he had his email open um, in a separate window, or if you have your, if in, or if he was sitting and he had his email you know, notifications turned on on his phone. Either way, he was able to see an email pop up saying that somebody logged in to his his account. Again, the kind of that making sure you still have those internal layers of security saying, hey, someone's trying to do something or there's a new device added or um, a new IP range or untrusted set of IP ranges maybe um, has, has access to your account. Is this you or not, right? Those things are important because had he not seen that, he would not have known that someone had got in. Luckily, he did. He was able to follow the steps to completely lock down that account, um, tell the application to sign out of everything. Well, the really, really bad part of the story and the reason why you should really stay away from uh, SMS one-time passwords is the attackers had his phone number and they had his SIM card already swapped. So since they were already there, whoever was there, you know, being foiled so quickly, they decided that they wanted to keep trying, but they didn't want this person to have access to their computer to thwart them. So their tactic was to call the local police using the local phone number and say that someone at this person's address was going to blow up the block or, you know, attacking family members or whatever they had to say to get the police to come out. The police did come out. And while my colleague was on his, um, spouse's phone trying to get his phone number in order again jumping through multiple different hoops because now there's so many different factors and so many different authorization steps is taking a while the police show up and basically thwart his attempts to reacquire his phone number back because the police think that there's this big problem and the bad actors were able to have more time um with his phone number you know trying to to do other things all that just because he used uh, SMS one-time passwords instead of a different um, password or, or, or code management system. Luckily, applications for time-based one-time passwords are very prevalent. Um, there's no, numerous of them. WSO2 uh, application you can download on your phone has a way to generate uh, one-time passwords, both as Guardian and Identity Server. Um, out of the box, we have time-based one-time factors uh, as a second factor of authentication that you can add to your uh, applications. And so using that over SMS is much preferred anytime, whether it's whether you're setting up an application as from a developer perspective, or if you're you know, adding factors to your own um, profiles, always prefer a time-based one-time password versus SMS one-time password um, when it's available. 
with anything is a bad story. And, 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 you know, these are kind of some uh, stretchy situations of where it can be bad, but it's all about finding balance. Right. And so when you look at the, you know, range of different decisions you make, everything affects it a little bit. Um, something is always gonna be less convenient and maybe more secure or maybe, uh, less privacy and more convenient. Um, it's all a, a, a weighted decision. And, and so it's important to evaluate everything because if an admin is just sitting behind their desk and they're, you know, with their own technological prowess and expertise, considering that any user can jump through these hoops to get to their information, that's not always true. Some users can't, and some users do have more difficulty. And, and it will have a cost. There will be someone who has to do something extra in order to implement a security. Um, and then the opposite side from a user perspective, how important is the convenience? How important is the, oh, I just have a really easy name, really easy password. Um, yeah, I use the same one for everything. Yeah, that might be easy. You can get around everywhere, but what's the cost of someone being able to just get into anything you ever, anything you want. I worked for a, uh, company that managed, um, water utilities. And for a while, all you needed was the home address to get into an account to pay your water bill. That's pretty convenient. That's pretty great. At the end of the day, though, someone being able to see all their neighbors and everyone's water usage, that's not very private, right? That's, that's lowering the privacy uh, for that convenience. And so adding a single extra step of uh, some sort of code or some sort of pin of some kind gives the people just enough, just, you know, full privacy with just a little bit less convenience. So it's all a balancing act that you have to weigh when you're adding different factors of authentication. That's the end of this presentation. I know we didn't demonstrate anything. We just kind of talked, <laughs> talked about stuff. Um, be sure to follow us on our, on our social accounts. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. Um, and we are putting out content for, you know, API, uh, involving APIs, um, identity access management. We have our new products, um, as Guardio and Corio. Definitely check out that content if you want. Um, and again, uh, ask any questions, please comment and, uh, we'll get back to you. So thanks everyone.